Coming up next hour, you'll want to hear a really compelling interview that I had with Terry Olson. Terry was released just last month from prison after 11 years for a crime he says he didn't commit and for a crime that might not be a crime at all. You're going to want to listen to this. He worked a lot with a group called the Innocence Project of Minnesota. Tom Weber on NPR News. It's been more than a month now since Terry Olson for a crime he says he didn't commit and which might not have even been a crime in the first place. 11 years in prison, to be exact. A group called the Innocence Project of Minnesota got involved with the case as well and did a lot of work to get him released. Terry Olson now joins me in the studio. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm glad you're here. Your attorney, David Schultz, is also in the studio here to accompany you, but... Uh, I don't know if I'll have a question for you or not, but I'm going to focus a lot on you, Terry. How how are you doing? I'm uh, getting used to the changes. Uh, a lot has changed in the last 11 years, especially in the technology world. And uh, you know, I had mentioned to David yesterday that uh, you know, years ago we used to talk on our phones, <laughs> and now we talk to them, and they do things for us, and. Uh, it's, it's a change. It's yeah. a switch. The iPhone was not released when you went into prison. No, no, no. So you have an iPhone now? Don't or? think I've even seen an iPod, and that's probably ancient now, huh? Yeah, iPods are so yesterday, <laughs> man. <laughs> we'll get into the iPads later and all yeah, of that stuff. You know. you know, it's so interesting about all those little things that we don't think about how we're different with day-to-day -day life mm -hmm. 11 years ago. Technology is... An easy one to come up with pretty quickly but what else what else is just so different on just how you live that life day to day well it's the it's being able to get back into doing what it is you want and need to do mm -hmm. rather than being directed as to where to be and what to do all day long yeah. you know and you have the privileges now that uh, uh, aren't allowed to you in prison What's what would you say is going well, and what's maybe not going well yet in the transition? Uh, I think what's going well is just uh, uh, adjusting to everyday living again, mm -hmm. and uh, getting back into the swing of doing things that I used to like to do, and yeah, um, being able to walk to a refrigerator and open a door is something that you don't do <laughs> right. in, in prison and being able to have that uh, uh, privilege to do that again and, and of course eat all the right foods that uh, you don't get there right and so on it's um, getting used to the crowds uh, and and you know I won't been to a hockey game yeah. so okay you know uh, that was an adjustment um, I still have a problem with, you know, I'm at a hockey game and people are still all thumbs on their telephones. <laughs> and why'd you come here? You know, <laughs> if you're not going to watch that. Yeah, hockey game. and in fact, my own buddy was like, "Why did you shut your phone off for?" And I said, "I came to watch a game." Yeah. So I'm I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm like <laughs> I'm like your friend. I, yeah. I think that if I were at the game, I'd be sending that, a text or two. Well, my niece told me that she was going to make me just like their everyone else. So. <laughs> In terms of that, so. within a few months you'll uh, yeah you'll have adapted. Um, you know the story here is that there was a man named Jeff Hamill whose body was found on a county road just outside of Buffalo, Minnesota, in August of '79, and it was as I res as I remember it, it was a closed case. It was not thought initially to be a crime until many years later, and then mm -hmm. in 20, 2007, 26 years later. You were convicted. What, what what do you remember from just that whole? It's just an incredible story of how this all happened. What do I remember? Uh, it was a nightmare. There, there isn't a whole lot that that uh, goes through your mind while that's going on because you're in shock. You know, I, mm -hmm. I couldn't believe that I was there. I couldn't believe why I was there, and I couldn't believe what was happening to me. Um, this was over with in 1979 and why they brought it back up is beyond me so and what you mean by that is that this man died and in that moment 
there was a there was no thought to be crime committed that it was an accident correct and none of the three defendants that were charged in the in the end uh, were even there um, so it's puzzling yeah well and what do you remember from that night I mean you did have an interaction with this man I mean there was a party you were all that is that right? sure would... well we started out at a bar uh, on our way back to uh, uh, after party, mm -hmm. uh, we picked Jeff Hamill up hitchhiking. He was hitchhiking. So yeah. you never met him before? No, we saw him at the bar, and he also worked with us. I, I, I knew him for probably a total of three weeks. I see. And uh, uh, after we picked him up hitchhiking, we, t you know, he asked, can you give me a ride to Buffalo? That's where I live. I was like, well, we're not going there, but we'll take you as far as we're going. Mm -hmm. And he said he had friends in the area that he felt he could get a ride the rest of the way home. So when we got to the after party, that was it. That was the end of it. You, last said, time you I said goodbye to him. Yeah, it's the last time I saw Jeffrey Hamill. And then he walked along and then and yep. then was found mm -hmm. the next morning. I actually saw him the next day on the news uh, while I was watching the news with my father. And I was like, we dropped him off last night. You know, and they're talking about how it was a hit and run and so on and so forth. They have any information, call. So I called. So you called? Yeah. We went in, we interviewed, we told them uh, everything that we knew. We also took polygraph tests and, and passed those as well. And uh, they cleared us and it was over with until 2003 when they came and interviewed us again. And the reason that happened, I understand, one of the other men <coughs> who you knew, Dale Todd, Correct. Um, he all of a sudden said that the three of you, and there was a third man as well, mm -hmm. did it. Right. What is your recollection? And and there's, you know, mental illness at play here with Dale. But what what is your what have you been told about how that panned out? How did this ever go from a closed case mm -hmm. to all of a sudden Dale well, saying these things? I don't think it was an all of a sudden Dale Todd saying these things. I think he was coerced beyond a line that you should cross, and in time basically told them a story and these are his words that they gave him you know because they won't believe him when he told the truth you know so they being the Hamill family or the, the police? authorities yeah the authority yeah. when did you realize I guess this is around 06 07 then mm -hmm. that the net was starting to close in on you I'm just trying to think of you know how did I uh, boy I guess well, initially, of course, we were arrested November 4th, 2005. 2005. Yeah. So you were arrested. He had told this story. And then what? You were questioned first and then arrested? I mean, were, were you at yeah, home? Yeah, he in told your... the story sometime back in 2003. And then at uh, the end of uh, 2005, towards the end, uh, that's when they took it to a grand jury to get charges. And, and uh, so I knew that was coming. Mm -hmm. You know? And, and, uh, and I was like... What do you do now? You just sit back and wait for it to happen because there's nothing you can do about it. So they, what, you just came to your house and you were waiting? And yep. They arrested you? Mm -hmm. I mean, didn't you have a lawyer? Wasn't there a way to say, guys, this isn't, there's, well, I, there's nothing I true about that? I consulted a lawyer beforehand and, and he was like, uh, it's not a matter of if you're going to be charged. It's a matter of when. Because when they convene a grand jury, you pretty much... You're always going to get a bill. And, mm. and uh, so I knew it was coming. I, I think I would like to bring David Schultz here in a moment, because you're an attorney. You know how this roughly works with the, with the criminal world and the criminal um, justice system. Yes. I mean, when you hear this story, what, what's sticking out at you? What, 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 and you weren't involved at this time? Not at all. But, but as you've learned this story, just what pops into your head? The, the thing that I've analogized it to, a, a lot of these wrongful conviction cases are they're like they're like an airplane crash because it's usually it's not just one thing. It's a series of events that build on each other and all go wrong to all of a sudden end up with the plane crashing or in uh, Terry's case, uh, finding himself being put on trial and then being convicted of murder and it's 
you know, you recognize that it's awfully hard for the participants where when they're in the middle of it to step back and and think, now wait a minute. It does this make sense? Is is are we seeing the right picture here? There's you know, um people get very invested in wanting an outcome. You know, police want to close a case. Um, prosecutors, you know, they're lawyers, they're people, they're competitive. But there was no case. This was a cl- this was an accident. Exactly. This was an accident right. the night of, right? <laughs> exactly. I right. couldn't have said it better. But uh, you, know, you the, know, right? And and they built on each other. And give you an example. Um, so the police single out Dale Todd of the three people that were identified as um, having seen Jeff Hamill at that bar: mm-hmm. Ron Michaels, Dale Todd, and Terry Olson. They select Dale Todd because he's the one they think they can break. But the breaking they do is to subject him to a very lengthy in-custody interrogation, five or six hours at the end of a work day. And they lie to him and they tell him, you know, we have a baseball bat from the trunk of your car in 1979 and it's got DNA evidence on it. Uh, We have an eyewitness um, and eventually they break him down, they wear him down. None of that was true, by the way. Right? None of that was true. Yeah, correct. Right. Um, and then they end up um, getting him to parrot back a lot of the details they've given him, but he also embellishes and adds details of his own, which are demonstrably false, like, I vomited at the scene of the crime. Well, the police absolutely, with a fine tooth comb, went over the scene of the crime. There was no vomit in the area. So then the police take that quote-unquote confession, bring it to a medical examiner, um, and say, change the death certificate from undetermined to homicide. Um, And um, she's, frankly, somewhat reluctant. And finally, they just say, look, we have an eyewitness. We have an eyewitness. And in her mind, she says, well, if they have an eyewitness to the crime, then of course it's a homicide. But of course... That's not the function of a medical examiner. So it's one thing building on the next, and, and yeah. before you know it, Terry Olson is sitting in a courtroom in Wright County. But didn't you, you had a lawyer, right? A no, defender? You I had didn't no? have a lawyer until after I was uh, initially arraigned. Um, so you were... And uh, I, I was appointed uh, a uh, public defender in Wright County initially, and then I was appointed uh, a couple of public defenders from uh, Anoka County. So I understand that this happened to Dale where he suddenly said, okay, yes, this happened. Was there ever any point, Terry, where you said anything other than, you guys are crazy, I didn't do this? Never. You've always maintained what the heck is going on. From then all the way through this and, and right now today, we had absolutely nothing to do with this. This crime never happened. Uh, and, and there's absolutely no evidence that that shows that it happened. Why we ended up where we are today is something I can't answer. David? Yeah, if I can just jump in on that, one of the things that um, happened, is sort of apropos that question about have you always maintained your innocence, is before trial he was offered... Correct. A plea deal, and, and which is all f- often something that yeah, happens. That's pretty regular. And yep. but also in these innocence cases, he said no, because I, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Right. And and it was a good deal, um, but yeah. he turned it down. It was a deal where I could have walked out of the courtroom the very next day, and uh, I was actually uh, cautioned by the judge as to what it was. I was, you know, he was like, "Are you sure you?" You know what you're doing, Mr. Olson. I, yeah. Of course, I'm sure. And by the way, what kind of man does that? So the, you know. So the trial then goes on, mm-hmm. and Dale Todd testifies against you. He's this eyewitness yep. in the case. But was there ever any Exhibit A, Exhibit B, the baseball bat, the the fender from the car, or the the gun? You know, I mean, you know, the, other than no. what Dale Todd said, was there physical evidence? Nothing. Nothing. Virtually nothing. There was a body by the side of the road and yep. um, injuries that resulted in death. Mm-hmm. I'm the analogy I'm thinking of David as we talked to David Schultz, who's the attorney f- 
uh, working with the Innocence Project of Minnesota, which worked with Terry Olson's case. Terry is also in studio. I can picture this, the, the floodwaters, right? You get stuck, at, you get caught in the river when the floodwaters are carrying you downstream. Um, so that's the picture in my head. Yep. I'm still not able to grasp how the justice system does or doesn't allow for the person who's yelling at the top of his lungs, I didn't do this, to actually be heard. And and I think the okay. answer... Is the answer because everyone does that in court and, and, and we assume they're all liars? I mean, is that what we're talking about? I, I, I think there's a great deal of cynicism um, <laughs> on the part of um, prosecutors uh, who have seen day in and day out horrific crimes, judges who hear these trials and sentence people, and, and frankly even uh, criminal defense lawyers who have to be at least some portion cynical in order to be able to do their job. And so I think there's, A, there's cynicism. Yeah, he's saying he's innocent, but what do you expect him to say? Unless and until he takes a plea deal, he's going to say he's innocent. Did you have any thoughts about why? I mean, you're just sitting there, what, dumbfounded that this is happening? Well, yeah, I mean, you gave an, an analogy about, uh, you know, a, a defendant screaming at the top of his lungs, an innocent person. <clears throat> I've used the same analogy in that you feel like you're standing on top of Mount Rushmore screaming for help and screaming that you're innocent, but there's nobody listening. And nobody did listen until the the Innocence Project of Minnesota came along and, and until David Schultz from as an LLP came along. If they wouldn't have came along, if they didn't have the compassion to correct these injustices, I, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. I'd still be in prison. And, and it really is the work of the Innocence Project um, and the dedication of um, their um, legal director, Julie Jonas, who really She's pushes awesome. these cases. <laughs> um, the other part of it is that person standing on, on top of the mountain screaming, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, is supposed to talk through lawyers, and they have lawyers, and therefore that's his way to speak. Yeah. So you were convicted, Yeah. mouth agape, I'm sure, but then where, where did you go first? Was it Faribault? Inish? Have you always no, been? initially in the, in the state of Minnesota, they send you to, to uh, St. Cloud, uh, St. Cloud. Right, for processing. Yeah, that's your processing prison, and then they sent me to Stillwater. I was there from uh, January 29th of 2008 until November uh, 21st of 2012. So I assume it's some kind of a armored van of some kind or something. Big that, bus. It's a big bus that took you from the yep. jail, the courthouse, to still, or to well, St. Cloud. I think from the jail I just went in, in, a, in a sheriff's vehicle. A sheriff's vehicle. Yep. You show up. I think we've, we've all passed still St. Cloud on the highway there. Mm -hmm. Had you ever been inside a prison? Never. No. What do you remember from those first impressions of getting out of the car and saying, well, here I am? The mind has a strange ability to be able to shut itself off, especially when you're in total shock. And I just looked around at my surroundings and, and still couldn't believe what's going on. You know, how did this happen? So you're a zombie. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, this is my future? I'm looking at this going, this is my future, really? And I've done nothing? It, it uh, was overwhelming. And... Uh, it still is to think about it, you know. How in this country do you get convicted of a crime that never occurred? How does that happen? It's not supposed to, you know. From day one, either in St. Cloud or Stillwater, was there a? Was it still Zombie Land, or was it? You know what? I've got to work on this. I've got to write letters to people like. I, I, oh, I, don't I wrote a lot of letters. Did you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> David could contest to that. I think I don't think that there's a a, a law firm in Minneapolis that uh, in St. Paul that didn't get a letter from Terry Olson. But then those letters show up, David. What do what do people in those law firms usually do with those letters? Well, I can't speak for everyone, but I've I've been the recipient of letters like that, and. Um, what I do with them is first and foremost I read them um, and even if I you know if I don't have the resources to help them um, I at least respond to them 
Um, but, you know, most people, they get a letter like that. It's like, you know, it's not my area of practice. I don't have the, you know, I, I don't have the time and the resources to just Well, help. or I don't believe you. Or I don't believe yeah. you, absolutely, yes. Well, you have the old adage, in, in prison, everybody's innocent. Uh, you know, that if you, if you go to prison, they're going to... Right. The inmates there are all going to yeah. tell you I'm innocent. If you'd sent me every a single one, if you'd sent me a letter, Terry, yep. I wouldn't have believed you. Exactly, because we, I just wouldn't. I say that's the Mount Rushmore analogy, you know. But I didn't falter. I kept doing it. Yeah, I still had drive and hope that someday the justice system would figure this out in some way that it would come to fruition, that it would turn about, and. And the truth will be told. And Dale Todd does re-enter the story then, David. How? Within days of Terry Olson's conviction, uh, he does write a letter to the trial judge explaining that, in fact, uh, he had lied. They had nothing to do with it. Um, he sometimes says things because he's afraid that he's going to be punished worse um, for... Um, not uh, playing ball, so to speak. Those aren't his words, but that's um, what he says. And then the trial judge appropriately sends it to the lawyers, and um, essentially it sort of just peters out. And then in August of 2012, uh, Dale Todd gets in touch with the Innocence Project and provides a very detailed affidavit not only of what he could recall of the circumstances of that night, but also why and how he lied and what he went through and what his thought processes were um, in arriving at that lie. Um, and that recantation of his testimony at Terry's trial, you know, in a legal sense, that's a brand new recantation. And, and it entitles... Uh, Mr. Olson to a new hearing. The court disagreed on that, but uh, that's how Dale Todd re-enters the story. And I think it's important to for people to know that the second trial should have never happened. My trial. Uh, Dale Todd clearly recanted in the first trial. With he, Ron. Yes, and, and he clearly uh, told everyone, including the jury, uh, why he said what he said. And in, in his words, it was, no one would believe me when I told the truth. Which they, was that nothing happened. Yes. And they kept hounding me and hounding me on what they wanted me to say. And so he said that when Ron... It's in the transcript. Mike, Ron Michaels. Yes. Was on, and so yeah. when so that I was said... So I told them the story that they gave me. Those are his words. And so when he said that, the charges against Ron... Should have been dismissed. They, against all of us. But they were they were against Ron. Correct. But not against you. Well, this was Ron's trial before mine, so... And the yeah. charges, in fact, weren't dismissed. The jury acquitted him. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. the, the prosecutor refused um, to drop the charges, although I believe the judge at the time she said, wanted aren't it. you going to drop those charges? She felt it should have been dismissed. Yeah. But... The, you know, the the myth about Dale Todd that's also grown up or or was perpetuated um, by the other side of the case is Dale Todd was brave and came forward and told the truth. But the, the reality of Dale Todd was that for 26 or 24 years, he told a consistent story except when he was coerced on two occasions by the police. And the consistent story was that nothing happened. Nothing happened. Correct. For all of us who've never been in prison, right, and don't get what the day-to-day, -day, what it's like, what are you, what still stands out as whatever it was that you remember about being there? Well, w without getting too deep into it, because it's kind of a personal uh, experience mm -hmm. for each person, and there's no way, Tom, that I can explain it to you so that you'll understand it without experiencing it. But it's a different world, plain and simple. Uh, what we have out there and what is in prison are two different entities. A and uh, you learn 
by 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 watching and listening and understanding what the new law is that you're now living under. Uh, you know, because you have the DLC's law and you have the inmates' laws. How about where to go? Oh, I see. Yeah, you know, and you even with have prison. to. Yeah, you have to pay attention to both of them. Um, it's not a place where you're safe unless you follow those rules and, and, and understand them. And it's a different type of respect there than it is here. And you just got to learn it, you know? And and you got to involve into it and uh, do what you have to do uh, to, to survive. And it's... Uh, I really don't think you want to know, <laughs> to, to, to be honest. And, and I don't think really anybody should know that hasn't experienced it because it's not it's not pretty it, it, it's not you know you know if I were to be locked up anywhere I guess Minnesota w was probably a better place than most um, but needless to say I shouldn't have been locked up to begin with um, there's plenty I saw in prison that I'll never talk about again did you have stuff you'll never talk about again acted upon you? Did you escape without harm? I, for the most part, mm -hmm. yeah. But it's because, it, you know, like like I say, I looked, I listened, I adapted to my environment, and I didn't do stupid things that brought harm to me. I mean, it sounds like part of the process is to fly beneath the radar correct <laughs> you know don't get noticed right you don't want to be noticed you don't want to put yourself out there so that people are like well who's this guy you know what's he all about you know you just want to go about your business and and uh i concentrated on the law I, you know yeah. i i uh i put myself in the books i i read case after case after case and I read letter after letter and that kept me away from the element that I wasn't before I came to prison yeah and uh, did you have a job it worked out what was your job did you have a, a no, did you have I work? had various jobs I think the first job I had I was a clerk in the in uh, one of the uh, shops in Stillwater I've uh, I've worked in the kitchen I worked, uh, which is the worst place to work in prison. Um, the kitchen, the kitchen, <laughs> the kitchen is, is yeah, worse. It's terrible. Yeah. Why? Um, well, there you get to actually see how it's prepared. Oh, jeez. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and uh, so we won't go deep into no, that. No, um, no, no, no. Um, and uh, you know, for for three years, I was fortunate enough to be in the uh, interchange freedom and. Uh, uh, initiative program in in uh, Lino, and uh, so while I was there, I worked in the administrative building as a janitor. Um, well, by the way, what? Let's back up for the first forty-five years of your life. Mm -hmm. What What were you like growing up? What did you do for a job there? Uh, as As far as before I came to prison, I I was uh, a production engineer in telecommunications company. Uh, for several years, and then after that, I got into uh, metrology. I was a metrologist. I calibrated inspection equipment, certified its accuracy, and repaired it if need be, and did that basically mm -hmm. in the five to seven state area. You were released here, and I just want to read one paragraph from <clears throat> the Star Tribune story about you because we're talking about how you're screaming from Mount Rushmore. Um, this is from the Star Tribune story. Wright County Attorney Tom Kelly said Friday his office agreed to Olson's release because he had already served more time than he would have had he been sentenced under 1980 sentencing guidelines. He said Hamill's mother agreed to Olson's release. Kelly says he continues to believe Olson was guilty of killing Hamill. Quote, I don't have a hard time sleeping at night, he said, confident they charged the right three people in the case. 
quote, it's not like we threw three darts against the wall and randomly charged three individuals. Well, <laughs> you know, I I if I go back and, and listen to what the authorities have to say in, in this situation, I guess I wouldn't expect them to say anything else. Um, I'm innocent. I was innocent then. I'm innocent now. I know that. And in order for me to go forward, I'm not going to live in the past, and I'm not going to let those types of stories affect me. You know there's a mind game here, though, right? You exactly. Know, you know that because it's been introduced in our brains that you were guilty. Mm-hmm. How am I ever going to believe you? Well, there's a number of ways. I, you know, I could probably list a bunch of them. One would be, if I'm guilty, why, after we filed our habeas petition in the federal courts, did they come to us to make this deal? We didn't go to them. That's just one way. Yeah, the, oh. list, the, the list is long, starting with the two polygraph uh, tests, the lie detectors that you passed, mm -hmm. and that Ron Michaels and that Dale Todd all passed. Um, there is the um, release that they asked you to sign, um, releasing yeah. them, Wright County, from any liability uh, and uh, not allowing you to sue them. Um, and just taking the sort of the lawyer's eye to this, mm -hmm. the sum total of the evidence is a against Terry. Sure. Um, it, well, and let yeah. me just talk for a second about what the evidence is. There, mm -hmm. There's the statement of Dale Todd that was the anomalous statement and the testimony at trial when he was heavily, heavily medicated, unknown to the defense. Um, and in which um, what he testified to is um, that um, actually not that Terry did it. Uh, he said, oh, Terry um, pushed uh, uh, Hamill and then got back in the car, and then later Ron Michaels got in and said, well, he won't be needing a ride anymore. But the, the testimony of Dale Todd completely um, discredited and inconsistent with what he had said for 24 years, um, you know, a coerced confession. That piece of evidence is then used to get the medical examiner to change the cause of death. And in fact, um, when we had our state court hearing, she admitted she felt pressured to change the death certificate. And there was no, there was no forensic or medical evidence Nothing scientific that, at all. Nothing scientific at all. He had, pointed, a head, he had a head trauma. Right. Yeah. Which could have been what I mean. I think the one theory I read is that it could have been a farm sure. vehicle yeah. that with something right. raised up in the or air. And anything pr right. protruding off right. the back of a trailer, off the back of a truck. I, I've even thought, uh, you know, way back in 79, uh, they used to have um, vehicles with long extended mirrors. That's how we saw back then, yeah. you know that were attached to, to pickup trucks and, and vans and, and such as well. They, I mean, a lot of them came right from the factory right. that way. So so based on the scientific evidence, you couldn't say it's a homicide. Yeah. Um, she just accepted uh, that they had an eyewitness who was, of course, Dale Todd, who wasn't an eyewitness. Mm -hmm. And then the third piece of evidence, this is some total of the evidence mm -hmm. at his trial, is they brought in six snitches, six uh, jailhouse informants who were facing federal charges at the time and um, were able to uh, parlay their testimony against Terry into uh, better treatment at their own sentencing. Uh, but those six <coughs> were not only internally inconsistent one with another. About what? About the story? Like about the Terry story. Yeah. Terry was bragging yesterday, things like that. Right. Exactly. Um, and two of them, including two of them who said Terry talked to both of them at the same time and their stories didn't match but those were um, those uh, individuals testimony was countered by four or five uh, jailhouse um, inmates who said 
Never he have. never said any such thing, and I saw that he never actually talked to those guys. And by the way, every time he ever said anything, it was, I'm innocent. And those guys, those four or five inmates, have nothing to gain by their testimony. So that's the sum total. And, and from a, a cold, legal eye, um, there's only one conclusion here, and that's that he's innocent. The deal in which, for which you were released does not expunge your record. No. So what's what was the was it murder? Is it murder on your Correct. record? Second degree. Second degree murder. Yep. So that's still on your record. Correct. So does that mean if you apply for a job I and gotta have to disclose it of course. You have to say I was convicted yep. of murder. Right. And then you say to your potential boss, Look, <laughs> I was convicted of murder but I'm innocent. Mm -hmm. Is that future boss gonna believe you? You know, those are uh, some of the things that right now time I'm trying to put in line. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the process for me to get back to work? And in fact, how do I explain these things? Because anybody with a felony record has to explain it to their boss right? or any potential employer. Um, several things I can do in, in that manner. Uh, but it's going to take me time to put yeah. those things together. You're, you're going to have to print out all these it, articles yeah, and bring them with you to the job. Explaining it to you now uh, yeah. as to exactly how I'm going to do that, I yeah. can't do. But I can tell you that uh, David Schultz, again, was gracious enough to uh, uh, purchase a correspondence course for me in legal assistance. And as you might, uh, uh, you might assume right now, I probably know a lot more about the law than hmm. the normal, every average day Joe. So you could be, you could work in a law, in a law firm. Well, it's it's what I aspire to do now, oh. and uh, I want to complete that that legal assistance course. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's too many law firms in in uh, the Minneapolis St. Paul area that haven't heard Terry Olson's story, and, and that are not fully willing to hire me in a oh. heartbeat. Maybe you'll be in demand then. I think that this the story is very compelling, but I, I also have, uh, you know, uh, great support in Julie Jonas from the Innocence mm -hmm. Project as well, a and uh, there's plenty that I can do okay. to help people that were in the same situation as me. Do you know if you can vote next month? Yes, I can. Okay. Yep. I because my civil rights have all been restored. Okay. Yeah. You said one of the reasons you took the deal in which even though the record isn't expunged because you, you really wanted to see your mother. Well, she's up in the years. She's been handicapped for several years. Um, you know, I had uh, uh, great certainty in, in the de dedication and, and the compassion and the knowledge of the law that, that uh, uh, my attorneys had. I didn't have that same certainty in the justice system. And it's not just disappointing, it's regrettable because I live in such a, a beautiful country that things like this just aren't supposed to happen. And, and I grew up, you know, if you screw up, you pay your penance for it, right. you know, and if you're wrong, you admit you're wrong, you know, and, and to have something as serious as this happened to me it, it just it took all those beliefs and what I had before away from me they gave them back to me and, and uh, you know <laughs> what can you say yeah um, I'm going forward I'm gonna make it what was done to me what was done to the other due defendants and what was done not only to my family, uh, but the victim's family as well. You know? They believe something happened to their son that did not happen. And no parent should have to believe that. You know? Wish there was something I could do about that. Um, David, what are the the broader lessons? What are the things we should reflect on 
big picture because we're going to read headlines, we're going to read news stories going forward about person A or person B or person C being convicted of murder. I don't think the lesson here is to assume all of those are wrong, that every single person convicted is falsely convicted. I don't think that's the <coughs> lesson not here. Not at all. Yep. Not at all. The vast majority, the vast majority are clearly guilty. Um, two broad picture lessons, I think. One is, um, you know, for lawyers and clients out there, never stop fighting till the fight is done. Untouchables. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the other lesson, I think, is um, for those who are who are in the legal system, when you hear that one in a hundred defendant who is writing those letters and saying, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, won't anybody listen to me? What I think you have an obligation to do is at least stop and listen and think about it. Doesn't mean even them, they are all innocent, but we owe it to ourselves and to the defendants and to the victims and to our justice system to at least re-examine our own conclusions. David? I'd like to add to that if I could. Please. Do you mind? I think in our country, and it's been this way for uh, a very long time, and I don't see it changing any time too soon, but, you know, we have the uh, a stigma about, especially in our courtrooms, where you have an defendant sitting at this table, and you have your juror sitting over here, and the stigma is they're think well he wouldn't be sitting there he wouldn't have been arrested if he wasn't guilty so prove to me that he's not um, we're too quick to judge you know I mean technically you're innocent till proven guilty well technically technically that's that's uh you can underline that word a few times you know because uh, that means nothing. In a courtroom, if you don't have any forensic evidence that a crime has occurred, how do you convict someone? You tell the more compelling story. You know? Juries aren't skilled in what lawyers are, what coroners are skilled in. They're not skilled in DNA. They're not skilled in, in any of those things. We're layman's when we walk into that jury box, you know, and it's unfortunate, you know, because we don't know those things, we're going to side with the person that tells the more compelling story. Of course, that's just my opinion, but I lived it, and I listened to it, and, uh, Boy, are you mad? No, no. Where where does uh, uh hate come in, in in someone's life? What does that do to you? Nothing. Um, uh, for me to be uh, upset would only hold me down, you know. And, and I refuse to let that happen. I I had drive before this happened, you know. I, there were things in life I wanted to do. I missed 11 years of that. I'm ready to get back on the horse and, and ride down the road. What happened in between? Can't go forward if I live in the past. I'm all good, Tom. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your story. I appreciate you asking us. Yeah. Good luck to you. Appreciate that. Good luck with the iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want it? <laughs> and David Schultz, thank you for being here as well. Thank you.